In the small town of Acme, nestled amongst the lush Washington forests, college student Mandy Stavick's lifeless body was discovered in the river, shattering the peaceful community. For years, the killer remained elusive until a single plastic cup provided the key to cracking the case and unraveling the twisted web of lies and deceit. This is the chilling story of how one small piece of evidence brought a killer to justice. On the afternoon of November 24, 1989, Mandy Stavick went out for a run, never to return. She was an athletic young woman, so it was nothing out of the ordinary. Mandy's case had been clouded in mystery for years. Despite a slew of suspicions and DNA evidence from Mandy's body, police were unable to apprehend the true monster. What happened to Mandy Stavick on that fateful day? Why did it take the police so long to solve the case? And most importantly, who was responsible for her disappearance? These are the questions that plagued the Acme community for years. Welcome back to True Crime Expresso, where we delve into the depths of solved and unsolved cases, chilling mysteries, and haunting tales from all corners of the earth. Join us as we explore the murder of Mandy Stavick, an 18-year-old girl whose death shook the small town of Acme, Washington. We will explore the events leading up to her disappearance, the investigation that followed, and the eventual arrest and conviction of her killer. Mandy Stavick was born on April 16, 1971, to Glenn and Mary Stavick. Although her family life had gotten difficult after her parents' divorce, she loved spending time with them whenever she got the chance. Their life only got harder for them after Mandy's brother was murdered. Her brother Brent was shot and killed in Anchorage in 1975. He was killed on a property owned by the Fort Richardson Army Base, where he was authorized to go hunting. He was shot over 15 times, and his killer was never found. Losing her brother, Mandy knew the importance of living life to the fullest and appreciating those around her. Mandy was highly accomplished and never limited herself to mastering just one thing. She played basketball, was in the cheerleading squad, and was a top student. Mandy Stavick truly stood out. She was fluent in sign language and could speak Japanese. Those who knew her described her as being larger than life and extremely talented. After graduating high school in 1989, 18-year-old Mandy went on to Central Washington University, where she was interested in aviation and aspired to become a commercial pilot. On November 1989, she returned to her family home in Clipper, Washington, just outside of the small town of Acme, for her Thanksgiving break. On November 24, 1989, Mandy decided to go for a run and left the house around 2.30 in the afternoon. Normally, Mandy's mother would ride her bike alongside Mandy while she ran, but on that day, Mary decided to stay home because her sister was visiting, so Mandy went out with her German Shepherd dog, Kira, instead. Mandy's usual route was along the street where her house was, Strand Road, and then she would run to the Nooksack River and then back. Mandy's brother Lee had been visiting a friend that afternoon at a house on Strand Road between Highway 9. While he was there, he saw his sister running by on her way back to the house. She had less than half a mile to go before she would reach it. But Mandy never arrived home. About two hours later, Kira arrived back at the house without Mandy and was visibly upset. Mandy's mother's first instinct was to call Mandy's boyfriend, Rick Sender, to see if he knew where she was but he was also unaware of her whereabouts. Mary then called Mandy's friends, but none of them knew where she was. This resulted in Mary calling the sheriff's office. It wasn't long before everyone she knew in the area joined in the search for Mandy. Almost every member of the small rural community eventually helped look for Mandy. People searched on horsebacks and on foot. A local tracker tried to work with Kira, the German Shepherd, hoping that she would lead them back to Mandy. However, Kira started cowering in fear upon stepping off of the porch of the family home. Kira was an older dog, and experts believed she might have been kicked when she tried to defend Mandy against an assailant, resulting in a change in her behavior when she arrived home. After an intense two-day search, Mandy Stavick remained elusive. However, the course of events took a dark turn on November 27th, as authorities, to their dismay, made a discovery related to Mandy, but not in the manner anticipated by everyone involved. The local fire department embarked on a search operation in the Nooksack River using their boat. Their efforts led them to discover Mandy's lifeless body, entangled amidst debris in the south fork of the river, 
approximately six miles away from her residence. She was found unclothed, wearing only her shoes and socks. After conducting an autopsy, it was determined that Mandy was subjected to sexual assault and ultimately met her demise due to asphyxiation caused by drowning. Surprisingly, there were no apparent signs of a struggle near the riverbank where her body was recovered, despite the shallow water in that particular area. Mandy Stavick, a skilled swimmer and former lifeguard, tragically met her untimely fate near a body of water. The authorities determined that she had been rendered unconscious before entering the water, as evidenced by a wound on her head examined by the medical examiner. Based on her athletic ability, the police theorized that Mandy was abducted by an individual driving a vehicle. They speculated that her dog had been forcibly kicked into a ditch, while Mandy herself was taken to a location approximately five miles away from where she was running. It was there that she was subjected to a horrifying sexual assault. In a brave attempt to escape her assailant, Mandy fought back, resulting in scratches on her arms and legs, likely caused by the surrounding blackberry bushes. Unfortunately, her courageous efforts failed as her attacker caught up with her and viciously struck her head with a heavy object. Subsequently, the perpetrator heartlessly disposed of Mandy's unconscious body in the river, ultimately leading to her tragic drowning. During these events, one can only speculate about the fear and distress that consumed Mandy's thoughts. The tragic news of Mandy's demise left the local community in utter devastation, with more than 1,000 people attending her memorial service. There were no churches in the area that were large enough to hold that many people, so the service was held at the high school Mandy had graduated from just a few months prior. The obvious first suspect in the case was Mandy's boyfriend, Rick. Although the couple had been dating for three and a half years, their relationship was on and off. However, Rick was willing to cooperate with the police, who described him as extremely forthcoming when he gave his statement to them. He was eventually cleared of any involvement in the case. DNA testing was still in its infancy in 1989. Despite this, law enforcement managed to collect DNA evidence from within Mandy's body. However, the majority of state and local crime laboratories did not possess the necessary tools to identify and sequence DNA samples. Fortunately, the FBI laboratory possessed the required resources and thus received samples from Mandy's body. The FBI lab successfully isolated Mandy's unique DNA sequence. Police proceeded to obtain saliva swabs from 30 individuals within the community, hoping to find a match. Yet none of them proved to be a viable suspect. In their pursuit of justice, investigators tirelessly pursued more than 7,000 leads and attempted to establish a connection between Mandy's case and various other crimes spanning the Northwest region. Nevertheless, despite these efforts, the case ultimately reached a point of stagnation remaining unsolved. It wasn't until 2013, 24 years after the murder of Mandy Stavick, that the police got their first lead. The police were able to identify a potential new suspect, who had never spoken to the police about the case. In June of 2013, two women, unrelated yet connected by the thread of community, found themselves in Bellingham, a tranquil town nestled approximately 35 minutes from Acme. Their names were Mary Lee Anderson and Heather Backstrom. Chatting amidst the innocent laughter of their children, Mary Lee and Heather, along with a bunch of other mothers, found their conversation meandering towards an ominous chapter of their town's past, the unsolved murder of Mandy Stavick. As the conversation wound to a peak, Heather voiced a shocking belief. She claimed to know the identity of the killer. Mirroring Heather's surprising revelation, shock coloring her features, Mary Lee echoed the same conviction. Despite the women being relative strangers to each other, they shared a common thread. Mount Baker High School, a place both had once roamed as teenagers, the same school Mandy attended. Remarkably, their suspicions cast a shadow upon the same person, a man named Timothy Bass. Interested in the chilling coincidence that the same name had crossed both their minds, the women began to dissect their prior experiences with Timothy. In a story brimming with dread, Mary Lee recalled a night when she found herself alone with her child as an unexpected visitor knocked on her door. That man was Timothy Bass, a friend of her husband's who dropped by under the guise of using the house phone after a hunting trip. Once inside, he attempted to dial a number, but the call fell through. Alone and vulnerable, Mary Lee watched as he made his way to the bedroom, an ominous air filling the room. 
There, he voiced his desires to her. He wanted to make love to her. The audacity stunned Mary Lee, prompting a quick threat to call the police if he didn't leave immediately. Undeterred by her threats, Timothy continued his heated propositions. However, in the end, Mary Lee's determined spirit prevailed, forcing the intruder out of her home. Heather's unsettling encounter with Timothy, on the other hand, occurred when she was only 15 years old. This happened during the summer of 1989, several months before Mandy's horrifying end. As Heather recollects, a group of friends, including her, decided to visit Dairy Queen. She found herself in the front seat of a truck, navigated by a boy named Dan, with Timothy seated beside her. As they journeyed, Timothy commenced with overly assertive advances towards Heather, complimenting her eyes and going as far as to take out a pen from a cup holder to trace around her knees and legs, a bold step facilitated by the cut-off sweatpants she had on. This disturbing memory etched itself onto Heather, fueling her resolve to evade Timothy in the neighborhood. After discussing their uncomfortable encounters, they became increasingly convinced that Timothy was somehow entwined in Mandy's murder. In her quest for justice, Mary Lee reached out to Detective Ken Gates, her high school classmate who was now serving at the Whatcom Sheriff's Office. Gates, alongside other detectives working on Mandy's case, set to work to unveil as much as they could about Timothy. What emerged was that Timothy did not have any criminal record. However, they encountered something else about him that drew their interest. Back in 1989, Timothy Bass and his family were part of the local community living in close proximity to Mandy's beloved jogging route. His residence was a stone's throw away from Mandy's home, and their lives were presumably parallel in many aspects. With both Timothy and Mandy attending the same high school, friends who knew him then have said that he was very quiet and kept to himself. Timothy was 22 years old at the time when Mandy was murdered. He had never been contacted by the authorities in connection with her killing. Timothy, his brother, and their father had not been asked to provide a DNA sample. As the calendar flipped to January 1990, Timothy got married to a woman named Gina Malone and moved to Everson, Washington, located roughly 19 miles north of Acme. Timothy and Gina's life together brought three children into the picture, and Timothy maintained a quiet yet regular life routine. He worked as a delivery driver for a local bakery, the renowned France Bakery Outlet. Law enforcement officials found themselves on Timothy's doorstep, entangled in a mystery revolving around Mandy. They questioned him, but his vague awareness of the girl was suspicious. He didn't seem to know who they were talking about at first, and said he could barely remember who she was. The Mandy Stavick case was on everyone's lips, a notorious echo of a local tragedy, and her running past his house daily was a sight as common as the sunrise. How could he not know it? Detective Kevin, looking beyond his poker face, saw the scattered jigsaw pieces of probable guilt. They proposed a simple task, a saliva DNA sample, but Timothy refused, citing a dark cloud of distrust over law enforcement due to TV crime dramas where DNA intertwined with prison bars. His refusal only fanned the flames of their suspicion even further. Without the legal muscle to insist on the DNA sample, the detectives left but they intensified their watchful eyes on Timothy. In their relentless pursuit of truth, the detectives expanded their investigation to Timothy's workspace, a local bakery, thus crossing paths with Kim Wagner, the stern and resilient bakery manager, explaining their quest to gain access to information about their delivery routes so they could follow the employee and potentially collect a cigarette butt or some other discarded items that may contain his DNA, they carefully skirted around the exact reasons for their investigation. The bakery's owner, after understanding the detective's intentions, stood firmly against their request. He wasn't going to compromise without a binding legal document such as a subpoena or a search warrant. In 2017, Kim Wagner, the bakery manager, was engaged in an evening discussion with her husband and some friends. The conversation eventually steered towards the chilling unsolved crime from 1989. Suddenly, a realization dawned upon Kim. She remembered the detectives who had come to her bakery years ago. Their inquiry centered on Timothy in relation to that very murder. Time passed and detectives found themselves returning to the bakery, hoping to secure Timothy's delivery route details. On their arrival, they were greeted by the familiar face of Kim, who, having pieced the puzzle together, now offered to aid them in their quest to acquire Timothy's DNA sample. She said, I willingly offered to help, 
simply because I'm a mom now. Should something ever happen to my child, I'd hope for someone to assist me. The mere idea of Mandy's mom living without clarity on who could have caused such grief to her daughter, if I could provide any help in offering that crucial piece of truth, I wanted to do it. For numerous weeks, Kim found herself out of luck while attempting to procure any of Timothy's belongings that could possibly contain his DNA. Bizarrely, he always took his trash home, always wore gloves at work, and he was the only worker who didn't let the company wash his uniform. However, one day, he slipped. While busy at work, Timothy accidentally threw out a plastic cup in the trash. Spotted in action, Kim seized the moment. She eventually passed on the cup to detectives who immediately transported it to be analyzed. It took three lengthy months of anticipation before any news from the state crime lab arrived. That fateful conversation started when Katie from the lab called Detective Kevin. She said the words everyone had been on tenterhooks to hear. Kevin, we have a match. Upon receiving the news, a wave of elation washed over Kevin. He realized that after three decades of persistent probing, the case was finally solved. The pivotal day of December 12, 2017, witnessed detectives descending on Timothy's workplace and apprehending him. He was charged with severe accusations of sexual assault and the murder of Mandy. However, in his subsequent interview with the detectives, Timothy staunchly denied any involvement in Mandy's tragic demise. He spoke candidly about a clandestine relationship he'd had with Mandy, offering this as the explanation for the presence of his DNA inside her. He said he had slept with her just hours before her disturbing disappearance. He recounted their fateful meeting occurring before she left for college as he and his late father were out on a mountain biking excursion, an event his deceased father was conveniently unable to confirm. Timothy was adamant about the amount of time he and Mandy began to spend together, which ultimately morphed into a casual sexual relationship. Mandy's family flatly rejected his narrative, unambiguously stating he was spinning a deceitful tale. Timothy couldn't offer any basic information about Mandy, and not a single individual came forward who could substantiate having seen them together. Moreover, the absence of any recorded phone calls or written correspondence between Mandy and Timothy post her enrollment in college further discredited his story. Timothy continued to assert his innocence, propelling the case into the trial stage. As the commencement of the trial approached, Timothy's legal team endeavored to render the critical DNA evidence. They argued that the method through which the detectives had gathered the evidence had infringed upon Timothy's Fourth Amendment rights. However, the presiding judge overruled these assertions, deciding that the evidence would indeed be admissible during the trial. Simultaneously, amid this tumultuous period, Gina, Timothy's wife, filed for divorce. The wheels of justice began to turn in May of 2019 as Timothy's trial commenced. Over the course of two weeks, powerful testimonies from multiple witnesses solidified the case against him, contradicting his attorney's earnest attempts to paint him as innocent. One of the crucial moments from the trial was when Tom Bass, Timothy's younger brother, took the stand. Tom shocked the court with his revelations. He testified that, during the investigation, Timothy had confessed to sleeping with Mandy years prior and had solicited lies from Tom to corroborate the story. Furthermore, he relayed another encounter in which Timothy brazenly asked their mother to lie and provide him with an alibi, stating they were Christmas shopping when Mandy vanished. The jury, taking into account these compelling testimonies, including Tom's, delivered their verdict on May 24, 2019. Timothy was convicted for the tragic murder of Mandy. Aged 50, he was incarcerated with a sentence of 27 long years behind bars. For Mandy's bereaved family, the sentence provided a soothing balm on their wounds. Mary, Mandy's mother, found closure after years of uncertainty and doubt. While the sentence can't resurrect Mandy, a young, vibrant woman whose life was unfairly curtailed, it at least offers some solace knowing the one responsible for her cruel fate has been held accountable. Do you think that Timothy and Mandy could have had a secret relationship? Is 27 years in prison enough time for the heinous act he committed? Let us know your thoughts down below.